On D-Day, we were briefed the night before uh, by the commander of the airfield that D-Day was on. We got briefed in terms of what we were going to do, and the two of us were designated to fly a reconnaissance mission from that airport across to the uh, beachhead area, and then examine what was going on at the beach, which we did. And when we went across, uh, we could see that the whole of the channel was, we were at about 10,000 feet, was littered with vehicles, ships, and uh, all the stuff that was crossing. When we got to the, uh, the beach area, there was a wall of cloud it was about 10,000 feet high, and it was about 500 feet over the, cloud, over the beach. And we, so we had to get under it in order to do our reconnaissance. We were there to do visual reconnaissance or to make f photographs. We have cameras behind our cockpits. So we had a specific uh, duty that day on the way across before or at the time that the landing was beginning, it's first thing in the morning, we were there at about seven. So the two of us got across, got down under the cloud, uh, went up and down the, the beach, which was still empty. Then we went into Caen, which, which is the big city, and our job was to do a reconnaissance of Caen to see if there was anything that we should report in, in terms of troops or guns or anything at all. We did the reconnaissance over Caen at staying at about a thousand feet, and then hit the Orne River uh, as it runs north from Caen, and we went up the the Caen uh, up the up the river, and we came to this place where there were about thirty horse gliders on the ground that had come in during the night around the bridge at Ranville. The bridge at Ranville, across the uh, Orne at that point, was of crucial importance to the army of the Germans or the or our army because it was the only pathway across. And so the decision had been made to, by the British troops. They spent uh, they put thirty men in gliders horse gliders, each of them, there were about 50 horse gliders filled with people, troopers, and they all landed in the very same tough area, and there were no crashes, and nobody lost their life. These people landed, and the uh, troops all got out, and the pictures now are classic of these uh, gliders on the ground. Each one had a, a Dakota to pull them to wherever they had to go. They had practiced these landings for months and uh, had really got it down to a days. And so on the day in question, they were pulled across and released en masse, and they all landed right around just to the east of the bridge. So it was highly successful. Well, when I got there, uh, they were just fighting over the bridge. With, with, Trying to, the army was trying to add, uh, el eliminate the Germans on the bridge, and they were successful. So it was a very important drop. So I was stunned when I saw these uh, all these gliders. I had no idea they were going to be there. We knew that the all mass was going to move across on the ships. They were going to have parachute drops if they needed them. Uh, I didn't know anything about the gliders at all. Nobody had. They were to, that was top secret stuff. But it was a, from a, the viewpoint of something electric and satisfying to see all these gliders it was quite dramatic for a 19-year-old. And so uh, we went around the, the, the bridge at Vineville, took a look at it, and then left and went down to down and up and down the beach on a patrol as the troops were coming in to the beach, the Canadian beaches in Juneau. And uh, the 
regiment that I saw most of us was the Queen's Own Rifles. They were there in, in, in substantial numbers. We saw them coming in on shore, and uh, at the one point or another, I looked at my petrol gauge, I called it petrol, and it was next to nothing on it. So, because I had been flying uh, with the number one, and I used, used up more fuel, or, because I'm keeping up with him and back and forth. And uh, because if you're out here, and he's going to turn that way, you've got to turn and come over on this side, and you have to use more fuel than he's using in order to stay in position. I'm trying a Mustang One, which is an American product out of California, and I wasn't looking at the gauges. But when I saw the petrol gauge at zero, and I'm over the beach area, there was only one thing to do, and that's to get the hell home. So I said to my number one, it's time to go, I'm out of fuel. So we throttled, I throttled back, and I landed at a place called Thorny Island, an airfield was there, and my engine quit when I was still on the runway. So it was a close call, but finger trouble, but I was so excited by what I was seeing when I was involved in this operation in the day morning that I lost uh, proper judgment in terms of looking at my equipment. Before the invasion, we used to do a lot of vertical photography uh, on sites, but from D-Day on, we were using an oblique camera out the left side. And so if I saw a target that I wanted to photograph, I would have to line them up, and my pictures were t taken by pressing a button in my joystick, if they we used to call it. From the height we were doing, as we went across at about 10,000 feet, we were fairly high. We could see the whole of the channel, and just everywhere, ships, boats, ships, battleships, whatever, the whole armada was on its way across. And uh, that in itself was very ex experiencing in terms of being full of confidence that we would be okay. It, it was either British or Canadian in their ships and boats getting off as they hit the shore. We had a great deal of confidence in the ability of our, our force to be successful. And we were. Absolutely. This is the, what we've been hoping for for years and months and days, and suddenly we're there, and the whole thing is moving uh, steadfastly right across the channel, and we're part of it, and we were very excited about that. We really thought it was just wonderful. No fear was involved in anything we were doing. It's just that we were very pleased and proud to be part of this great movement of force and we knew it was going to be fine and okay. Then we got over to where the people were shooting at us and it changed our attitude to a little extent. <laughs> and uh, when we got close to shore, the naval ships back offshore were firing big guns against uh, targets that were onshore and had to be hit in order to knock out uh, gunfire uh, against troops coming in, and we could see that being executed. And uh, but we saw people, Queen's Own Rifles, there were people that I saw a regiment in from Toronto. A lot of them in one of the places that we were looking at the beach, as troops coming in. As a 19-year-old, I don't think I thought too much about the future on any tactical or overview sense. I knew that we were succeeding and that I was part of it and that uh, that was all that I had. I was tasked to do, I did, no matter what it was. I would, no matter how dangerous it was, I would do it. And they knew that they, that they gave me all kinds of funny things to do for over a period of several months. The Rommel story took place uh, in, on the 17th of uh, July in the summer of 44, and 
it was a very simple situation. I was sent out with a number number two. I was highly experienced by this point. And as I came up to this particular uh, place, I found a staff car with the top down uh, going down a road southerly. And uh, I didn't know who it was, but it was a German staff car. I'm well inside German lines. And I was not permitted to shoot up with my airplane any cars. So I did what I was required to do, and I was I reported to group control centers, a radio station of our own behind our lines, that this car was on this road going in a particular direction, top down, two men in the front, three in the back, and actually what happened was very simple. They sent in a Spitfire, at least one Spitfire, and caught this car going south on this particular road, all documented, and shot it up. And the driver was killed as this car was going down the road. The car went off the road and hit a stump, and the driver in the, uh, in the, the man in the right-hand seat was looking out over his shoulder backwards, and his, when the car hit the stump, his head hit the windscreen post and caved it in. He was thrown out, and, but he survived. And his name was Rommel, the, the great general. I didn't know who it was. I didn't find out until later on and it was when the story began to unfold. And uh, so Rommel survived. He was the, the, the top German general. And history tells us that he was all set to return to duty, and he went to Hitler and said, I'm now ready to go back. And uh, Hitler then gave him a letter from Hitler, which said, I'm convinced by the Gestapo that you were involved with the, with the group who tried to have me killed on the attack three days after the event where you were injured. And Hitler said, I will give you a choice. The two men who have brought the, my letter to you with a, have a cyanide pill. In the event that you take the cyanide pill, I will give you a state funeral. You will uh, be honored and your wife will be protected and your kids and so forth and so forth. If you fail to take the pill, then I will have you arrested and tried for high treason, commencing immediately. And uh, that's the alternative. So what happened was that uh, Rommel took the pill and he was given a state funeral. And all the reports to the press outside had nothing, it was an accident, they called it. Nothing else. It wasn't a shoot up. It was an accident. And that's the way he was killed by Hitler and buried with a state funeral. And he didn't commit suicide at all. He was killed by Hitler as a result of the accident and my catching him and bringing in the Spitfire that shot up his car. This was a way down the road in October from July to October, and he was killed in October by Hitler. So that's quite a different story than had been put up, but now it's recognized exactly what happened. It was Hitler deciding goodbye.